Last year, Robert Friedland received $160 million investment dollars from the Middle East. Ever since then, every single resource company seems to be running over to the Middle East to see what capital they can attract. Let's start with a little bit of a history lesson. Mel, we're going to be discussing today the Middle Eastern investment dollars in Africa. Can you start us out with a bit of an overview? Thank you. Sure. I mean, you know, unsurprisingly, different Middle Eastern countries have had interests in various African countries for a long time. Some of those have been more commercial than others. Um, if you take the DRC, for instance, the Lebanese have been very active in a very quiet way in the Congo for a long time. They trade uh, used blue jeans for diamonds and then, you know, build real estate from the diamond trade. So they have also been, uh, from time to time, accused of financing Hezbollah terrorist activities. And that obviously has posed a concern to the U.S. and other Western countries. But there have been many other examples. Morocco, for instance, has been in and out of the Congo as well, with varying degrees of commercial success, most recently during the first Kabila administration, when it looked for a few halcyon moments as if there might actually be some investment and then somehow or the other the deal fell apart. Um, there have been Middle Eastern countries interested in working on building the giant Inga Dam project, which would generate enough power for all of Africa, if ever done. Um, but again, those deals tend to fall apart. So in the DRC in particular, it's a checkered past that has been only moderately impactful in terms of what it has delivered for the country. But on the other hand, the Middle Easterners historically have done a better job of navigating complicated DRC waters than have the Chinese who've simply steamrolled their way through. That brings me to Jack. Jack, we're all involved in the critical mineral sector. We always talk about China. No one ever talks about the Middle East. Why don't you uh, start us off with why we should be paying attention, attention to the Middle East? First of all, it's very important for everybody to understand that people in country, wealthy countries like Saudi Arabia or the UAE don't give a damn about what's happening in the United States politically. Okay, And today, these countries have a huge amount of retained capital. A friend of mine who was uh, with Aramco told me that last year there were days when Aramco netted $1 billion a day profit. Okay? So there's a lot of money. And there are new ideas among the rulers of the Middle East, which is to develop their countries so that they're not one-trick ponies. They're not completely dependent on one natural resource. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for example has uh, the, the young man, younger man, who's going to be the king very soon, uh, has a plan uh, to develop Saudi Arabia as an industrial country by the year 2030. One of his targets is to produce 500,000 electric cars by the, a year, by the year 2030. How do you do this? Well, you can use the American model, but that doesn't work. So what do you do? You use the Chinese model. The Chinese model is you first build the infrastructure of natural resources, their processing, the industry to turn those processed goods into consumer goods, and then ultimately you have everything in your country to make cars. That's what they're doing. What is the nearest source of natural resources for Saudi Arabia or the UAE? Well, it's Africa. And as uh, Mel said, they, uh, the, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm an old man. I'm going to call them Arabs. The Arabs have been there for a very long time. In fact, as uh, people don't like to remember, when the Dutch arrived, it was Arab traders who sold them the first slaves they used in, in, in that. Okay. And uh, it, Mel mentioned about uh, Lebanese in the Congo. I, I met Lebanese in Ivory Coast. And uh, people here in America, just one more thing, 
They don't know. Africa is not one place. There's Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, and Africa Africa. And of course, in America, we don't pay attention to this because it doesn't matter. We're Americans. Over to you. Russell, where do you want to go? Well, I'd like to touch a little bit from on both what Mel and, and Jack said, which is normally I'm, I'm very granular and on the ground, but from the 30,000 feet looking down um, from the Middle East and, and really what's going on, particularly today with the conference in Saudi Arabia, on January 1st this year, the BRICS uh, community, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, um, expanded. And they expanded to include now UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Ethiopia, and, and, and Iran. And the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, if you looked at China and, and India, it was roughly about a third, maybe roughly 30% of the world's consumers with Russia um, providing with all the natural resources. Now you have uh, UAE and Saudi on this hunger that Jack has highlighted for uh, minerals. And with the uh, natural relationship with the BRICS, where are they going to look for this hunt for their EV feedstocks and such? Obviously, that would be uh, Africa. So although, say, five years ago, the investing world uh, would look at the BRICS as uh, a sideshow, now I think that uh, the BRICS community, which is now a community of 10 countries, all on aggressive growth pattern um, need to be a force to be reckoned with. And if you think about, we talked about uh, the DRC, you know, it's growing at six and a half percent GDP, fifth largest country in Africa. Um, if you think about what's entering the BRICS in terms of Ethiopia, the second largest country in Africa, if you think about uh, Saudi and UAE, mostly Saudi with the uh, the power and the ability to um, to industrialize their countries, as Jack said, moving towards uh, that, um, I think that you're going to see more and more Middle Eastern uh, investment into the central region of Africa, if not uh, both the eastern side with the ports and the western side with the ports. Jack, I'm an investor. Everyone's telling me sustainability, sustainability. I've got to invest in you know American investments, period. I'm um, told to be cautious about Chinese investment dollars. Should I also be, uh, should I also be concerned and cautious about uh, investments in the critical mineral sectors that have had a large percentage invested by Middle Eastern dollars? I think you're going to find that Middle Eastern dollars uh, come today with a lot more uh, introspection than they used to. And so most people from other parts of the world, when they invest in the United States, are put off by the regulatory problems, by the 10 years it takes from uh, discovery to, to a producing mine, if ever. Uh, I personally believe, as I just said before, that the Middle East is in a hurry to industrialize. The Middle East is in a hurry to break the connection that they've had for so long with their competitor, the United States. And I think that uh, my opinion, they're not so interested in investing in the United States. <clears throat> of course, Jack, if you have the Middle Eastern companies investing in the African companies, because I think we're all agreeing here that the Middle East is their primary focus with critical minerals is on Africa. Would you agree with that, Mel? Oh yeah, 100%, although not to disregard what both Russell and Jack have said about the interest also in developing their domestic resources. The Prince, for instance, recently signed an agreement with Japan's Sumitomo Corps to begin bringing forward the rare earth industry within Saudi Arabia, which is also a very astute political move because it helps from a US perspective to offset the decision to also join the BRICS. So the Prince is, as usual, playing multidimensional chess brilliantly and taking advantage of all the available resources. He's also said publicly that the enormous Saudi investment fund is not an instrument for making money. It is an instrument for realizing Saudi's economic development and social plans. So when you have trillions of dollars at your disposal and you're not worried if you're going to make a few investments that lose a lot of money, 
it means that the world is your oyster because you can take a look at any nationalities company doing business in Africa today and see it struggling and swoop in and remove the struggle by investing in it and then turning it into a success or if necessary, writing it off. That's incredible leverage. Russell, I'm gonna throw you under the Range Rover here and ask you the tough question. Middle East, we're Americans. Are they our friends? Are they our enemies like the Chinese have been positioned in the media? I think like all relationships, it, it's a, a morphing entity. And so what was once a friendship, uh, a dear friendship 30, 40 years ago, has turned into a relationship of convenience. And this relationship of convenience is actually starting to morph more into a friendship towards the East. And as I mentioned earlier about the BRICS, you know, it is really becoming a, a, a Western economy, economic zone versus the rest of the world. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar still runs rampant on Africa. If you go to anywhere, Central African Republic, the DRC, Zambia, you still get charged in U.S. dollar. They don't take Russian rubles. They don't take Chinese yuan. However, um, a lot of the trades now, as you see going forward, will be denominated in something other than dollars. Um, in terms of the Middle East, they still have access to large amounts of dollars. However, they will also start trading in other currencies, non-U.S. dollars. And so what I think is, I think what Jack said earlier about, uh, you know, looking, and Mel said earlier about looking to grow their own economies, they're going to grow their economies for the better for their people. Um, and if that means doing business with, uh, you know, uh, countries that are on the uh, bad boy list, uh, such as Iran, or breaking sanctions via Kyrgyzstan into Russia, or having Russian troops in the CR, CAR so you can get your minerals out of the CAR into the markets. That's what's going to happen. And I don't think there's anything that the West can do about it. And, you know, if I think about there was an announcement today out of Saudi Arabia saying that they've signed a uh, memorandum of understanding with the DRC uh, for further investment in the DRC. And then I turn around and I look at what the EU has done. They've offered 50 million euros to go into uh, to the Congo um, uh, to explore for minerals. And it's just the West is so far behind the Middle East. I think the Middle East is now just a, a relationship of convenience uh, for the West. The Another board member for the Critical Minerals Institute told me that as long as the Middle East stays aligned with the energy mandates of the United States, they're not going to have any problems. So I want, I want you to comment a little bit more about this, Russell. Also, since you do run, since you're an American that runs a London-listed company in the, critical minerals co in the critical minerals sector in the Congo, can you comment on the Brits as well and their perception of the Middle East? moving in, or they've always been there, as Mel has stated. Correct, Mel? Yes, but they're just expanding their presence. Can you comment any further on that, Russell? The British the British interests. Yes. So I was actually on an email exchange yesterday with Lord Poppet, and Lord Poppet's the uh, representative in uh, Rwanda, Uganda, and the DRC. And there's an aggressive push towards the uh, United Kingdom uh, entering those three countries. The reality is, is unless there's capital allocation, and the capital allocation is not in the way of loans, right? The capital allocation is that a country comes in and says, we're going to invest. And if it happens to go to zero, it goes to zero. But if it, if it works out the way it should, we're going to get the offtake and we're going to be able to export that to our country to beneficiate, to make uh, batteries, rechargeable batteries and such. And so, again, this this happened yesterday on my exchange. Uh, there's lots of noises coming out of the West in terms of trying to make things happen. But the difference is, is Middle East, the Chinese, uh, the Indians uh, are all allocating capital, actively making things happen. And um, it's actions, not words. And unfortunately, I see the British, much like the Americans, much like the Canadians, uh, a lot of words and no financial allocative actions. Back to you, Jack, because you do a lot of work. You get a lot of, you receive a lot of phone calls from the U.S. government and, of course, automotive companies alike. Is anyone talking to you on this particular topic? The only thing that's happening is that the automotive companies are quite aware of the fact 
that there are all the resources they need could are in Africa, could be coming from Africa, but they don't know how to approach them. They have no idea. So they're aware of it, and that's it, okay? Uh, I have never discussed anything like this with anyone in the government. Uh, I doubt that anyone I know would even understand the problem. Okay, well, so this is a perfect segue to Melissa with strategic relations with the U.S. and with uh, Africa, for instance. I'd like you kind of about this, but further to this, and my board had been contacted, he told me, uh, when a acquisition play was being made by the Chinese for a South African critical mineral company, and the government had called him to say, should we stop the Chinese? Do you know of anything that's happening like that for Middle Eastern investment, for instance, in Africa? And what would you recommend that we as Americans and Canadians and, and British and Australians do with our relations with Africa right now? And where would you start? This is a big question. Well, what I can say in response to that is that just as is the case with Africa, quote unquote, being actually so many ind individual countries and Americans not always thinking about that. The same is true for the Middle East. So from a Washington policy perspective, it matters greatly which country you might be talking about investing in what where. So for instance, right now, Saudi Arabia, um, the Biden administration has a very positive outlook on Saudi Arabia. Prior to the beginning of the current um, Israel-Hamas war, um, this administration was actively trying to broker some relationships for Saudi Arabia in the DRC as part of a broader deal affecting relationships in the Middle East. So given that as a preliminary statement, if it was a Saudi investment that was under discussion, there probably would be not so much heartburn in Washington as if there was an Iranian investment being discussed. That would definitely be a blocker because they're already on the enemies list. But countries that are not, China having recently landed on it more or less, um, but countries who are not on that list, if the government in Johannesburg were to pick up the phone and call Washington and say, oh, the Saudis want to buy a, a company here, Washington probably would be fine with that because the other problem is we're pretty far behind the curve in terms of Washington's realization of what the impact can be of these targeted Middle Eastern investments. And by the time, as was the case with China, that Washington wakes up and bestirs its behemoth self to develop some policies relative to the question you posed, probably too late to have any material impact whatsoever. The goods will already be gone. Russell or Jack, can you comment on the technology advancements of the Middle East, for instance, on things like rare earth extraction technology processes? Do you know where they are in the food chain? Well, I tell you that um, a lot of that has come out of uh, the Western universities. Uh, a lot of the Middle East are educated in uh, Europe and the U.S. And although the technologies are fairly new, um, they are extracting that from from the Western world and trying to bring it back and replicate it in Saudi. Um, I think with, again, with this BRICS uh, thesis uh, and China having the, uh, let's say the head start of 20 years or so on the rare earth processing, I think you're gonna see some type of amalgamation of processes. And I think you're gonna see something very interesting come out of the Middle East in terms of rare earth processing. We know that the rare earth companies are speaking to uh, Saudi and UAE type uh, investors. No, for a fact, because I have a friend that runs a rare earth company that's speaking to him. So I think that you could see um, some type of rare earth industry emerge from the Middle East. And again, it, it would make a lot of sense because they're playing the West against against Asia and, and the East, and uh, they're playing neutral. So to me, it, it does make a lot of sense. Back to you, Mel, because this is a strategic uh, comment that Russell just made. Is that your perception as well that you see happening? Limited to today's Washington outlook, Saudi Arabia is seen as a friend and China is seen as a foe. And from those very simplistic terms, absolutely, the United States would have far less uh, heartburn 
over supporting Saudi Arabia's development in Africa, especially if it was seen as eroding China's influence. Jack, you like to uh, comment frequently that you have over 60 years of professional experience, so you've seen a couple of historical cycles. Would you like to talk about what you see happening if we continue down this road, or would yeah, you like um, to offer some advice or both? No, uh, Russell is right. The, uh, the rare earth companies are very much interested in uh, Saudi, uh, not, uh, not to mine rare earths in Saudi Arabia, but since Saudi Arabia is quite frankly focused on getting rare earth uh, ores and concentrates into their country, they're of course going to need processing. Now, note that the Chinese have just recently uh, officially uh, cut off any export of technology or equipment uh, required. But uh, rules are meant are made to be broken. My guess is that the Chinese are now in Riyadh uh, drinking uh, Muay Thai and uh, imported and, and uh, saying to them, you know, uh, rules could be bent. And uh, if you let us build an industry here, maybe, okay, we, we might bend the rule. On the other hand, Sumitomo doesn't need the Chinese for all of the technologies required to make rare earth permanent magnets. They know how to do that. So they're, they, they could set up there. It's actually a great place for technology, rare earth processing technology, to be sold, implemented, et cetera. Oh, gee, in the United States, we don't know anything about that anymore. So I guess we won't be the seller. And we won't be supplying them with rare earth ores or concentrates. So what have we got in this? Hmm, nothing. Okay, <laughs> I guess that's it. Ouch. I'm going to go back to you, Mel, just simply because of your foreign service background. You've seen and you've traveled internationally. You've been boots on the ground in the Congo and many other countries around the world. Do you have any comments about how Washington might uh, be redirected with the current formula? Should it be proceeding the way Jack has just narrated? You know, there's very little impact that Washington can have on that scenario that Jack outlined, unless they're willing to make some very difficult and relatively dramatic domestic political decisions <clears throat> in terms of doing pragmatic things with permitting regimes, in terms of doing pragmatic things with direct capital investment and mine development and direct capital investment in accelerating processing technologies is there's no current indication that they're going to do that. The only thing that would shift the dynamic would be the entry of another player, another inimical player on the stage, and I'm thinking about Russia. Russia also has long ties to Africa. Russia also is interested deeply and has been for decades in rare earth and critical materials for the defense industry. And Russia has far fewer scruples, even <laughs> than the Middle Easterners do. Probably far fewer scruples even than the Chinese do when it comes to accessing what they need, particularly since they are capital poor. So if we saw Russia emerging as a player in this dynamic in Africa, Washington would certainly be forced to take some more dramatic interest and some more dramatic steps, both at home and abroad. Russell, your boots are on the ground. You finish a long day. I, every time I send you a message, you're like, can't talk. I'm in the Congo. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end of the day, when you, when you have a nice drink, you know, you might Russians, Chinese, Middle Easterns at the bar. What are we, what are we dealing with here? Well, it's fairly complex. Now the Russians are now uh, guarding that uh, area in the uh, Rwandan, Ugandan, Northeast corner of the Congo. And if you look back, say 2020, when President Tichikeri actually visited Washington, and the U.S. said to him, we'll give you military uh, support, military cooperation. The only problem with that is, is the U.S. government also trains the Ugandan and the Rwandan armies. So uh, the complexity of the U.S. government uh, you know, funding militaries who were actually in battle in certain areas, uh, and I mentioned the corner, the northeast corner of the Congo, 
it's a complex uh, situation to try to unravel. And we are seeing more and more Russians uh, enter Africa uh, to try to keep the peace. But the reality is, is Russia is looking for their offtake. And again, it's becoming more and more complex. And I suggest it will probably continue to become more complex as the demand for these unique strategic critical minerals grows. Um, on the ground, we've seen the Israelis. Uh, on the ground, I've seen um, you know the UN people leave. And so when, when a peacekeeping organization leaves and leaves a gap, uh, and the fighting starts, you know, who is there to try to keep the peace? And it's a rhetorical question because it's complex and the answers aren't really evident to me right now. Okay, so it's complicated. Jack, I am certain you have some commentary yeah. in response to Russell. No, no, in, in addition to Russell. Uh, look, you know, everybody's, Russell entered the magic word. Demand. Everybody assumes, well, whatever the demand is in, in New York or London, that's that's the important one. No, it isn't. Not to these people. They have, they have domestic demand, not only the Middle East, but the Africans and the South Americans. And we have trained them how to find these materials, process them. And more and more of them are saying value must be added in our country so we get more benefit. Uh, in South America, just to make a point, the Chileans have nationalized lithium industry, okay? And the Chinese came in and said, okay, uh, we'll make our we'll make batteries here, and we get to export most of them to our country because you don't need them. But when you do need them, we'd even make cars here. Now, American companies uh, walk around with their fingers stuck in various parts of their anatomy and say, Oh, that's a good idea. We'll talk about it after the next quarterly review because, you know, the share prices, blah, blah, blah. Other, the future demand for critical minerals is in the Southern Hemisphere where most of the, and let's say where half the world's people are. They have the resources and none of the benefits. What do you think is going to happen? You remember the liberal world order? That seems to be ending. It's regional now. And as uh, they say, those that have the lithium control the lithium. So, so good, good point. I want to ask you a little bit further on that. Let me just redirect these questions to all three of you. I'd like all three of you to answer this question. So right now, we're announcing in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, we're putting these billions of dollars of investment into finding more of the critical minerals we need mm -hmm. to advance our technologies and be competitive worldwide. Jack, do we need to be putting more time, or should we just be keeping it within our own countries or should we be looking at Africa? Because clearly the Middle Eastern uh, investors are. I, I don't think the US uh, is going to do very well in Africa. Uh, I think that we, we are the hind end of, of, the, of the dog because you, you've you had the European empires there forever, the Muslim empires there forever. People live there, they know the languages, they know the people, they're looking for the resources. We're coming over there and saying, hey, have you seen the latest Broadway show? They have no idea what we're talking about. And we don't have any money, okay? Not compared to the, like Mel said, our guys strictly are to making money for themselves. The Saudis, for example, are they don't have to worry about that. Like like Russell said, they're making they can make an investment, they can make money or lose money. The whole point of their investment is to advance their nation's uh, welfare. Okay, that is not the point of American investments. It is to make money. The third world, or is that what they call it now, or the, the rest of the world? Yes, we're, we're not using third world anymore, Jack. Okay, okay, okay. I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I still remember the British Empire, okay? So, uh, look, you know, to, to, I guess this will be my last comment. It's over for us. We're not running the world from, from either Washington or London. It's We're not running the world. We're reacting. We don't have national... 
we have, we're against China Incorporated, Saudi Arabia Incorporated, and then there's, you know, 500 uh, corporations in the United States, 100 corporations in Great Britain. Governments can't support this. Our governments don't understand this. This is not the way they function. So we're screwed. Russell, I'd like you to comment because I'm getting to you, uh, Mel. I, I would like you to, to finish this particular question. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with uh, I, Jack? I agree with what Jack says, and I'll add to it. I look at, um, you know, I sit in Africa and I look at what Africa has to offer. Billion people, natural resources, a hungry consumer class, um, little power, little food, um, but the desire to improve oneself. I look at, say, North America, and I see some of the most incredible technologies get developed. It's a big laboratory that, um, and there's a reason why people like Elon Musk uh, move from South Africa and come to North America and be successful, right? Because this is a can-do, You, the North America is a can-do place. But the reality is, is those can-do attitudes and that laboratory needs to be transferred into Africa somehow. Right, where where the source of the of the raw materials are, is, and I think what's happened now is um, Jack's right. We we've we run it down. You know, every empire lasts for about 150 years. It's pretty clear that the the up and coming empires, either China or, or India, um, but North America still has its role to play. Now the reality is is. Are we going to be insular and just say, well, we're only going to give capital and allocate capital on a win or lose basis in North America and to the detriment of the countries? Or are we going to say, look, what do we want to be in 50 years and what do we need to do to get there? And I think that's what, what Canada and the U.S. must do is say, look, we have to be intertwined. We are going to be the third dog in the race, but we need to take our intellectual capital and our IP, and put it in Africa and create value there uh, for the benefit of both Africans and also the North Americans. Mel, I would love for you to conclude this point. I just want to remind you that once you told me about another topic, you said, when Americans decide there's a problem, watch out, okay, or something to that level. So I would like to hear an optimistic conclusion to this particular point, please. I don't know if I'll achieve optimism, but I do want to offer some nuances and some cautionary tales that may lean a bit towards optimism. Um, you know, it's amazing to me, given how little America has done for African nations, that so many African nations still prefer America as a partner and still look to America as a power player that can be of useful uh, influence for them. And some of that comes from their experience of the boots on the ground because the few American companies that have had and still do have a presence in Africa by and large treat Africans much better than the Chinese do, for instance, or than the Middle Easterners do. Jack's reference to the slave trade. And that's an advantage that we have not utilized to our, to our advantage. Because as Russell rightly indicated, Africa is a long-term play. You have to build the relationships. You have to invest your intellectual capital, but you also have to invest your time capital. And for cultures like China and the, and the Middle East and India, that he have a different outlook on time and therefore are better long-term strategic thinkers than the United States is. Because we've always been bad at it. People say, oh, well, you know, it's the quarterly business cycle now. No, we've always been bad at strategic planning. Everything that comes to us is a big surprise. So we have failed to capitalize on our advantages in Africa so far. That's the nuance. The cautionary tale, and this applies to the Middle East as well as Africa. It's a problem that the prince in Saudi Arabia is very aware of. The ticking time bomb of unhappy youth. You know, in Africa, across the nations, 
They are the youngest continent now, and they are going to continue to be. And they are well-educated, and they are restive. There's just not enough demand for the human intellectual capital that exists in Africa. This is a strategic problem, not just for the United States, but for the world, because we see how disruptive wars are. And we know the history of the African continent in terms of war. And particularly when we're talking about the importance of that element, that continent, as a supply source for the future of all of our economies. The last thing collectively we should want is for those nations to explode into poverty-driven, frustrated wars. But it's tending that way. So the optimistic note that I think I can strike here is there's growing realization of this. And I think that an inadvertent consequence of the scramble for critical materials in Africa could be saving the youth of Africa by providing more and better jobs in more diverse industries and thereby staving off the conflict that could cripple us all. So if I was President Biden and I called the three of you and said, can you come up with a strategic relationship strategy for one country in Africa? Because you want to have one test, obviously, and you pointed out that there's numerous countries in Africa. Could you three, could you, could you three fix this mess? Absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to fix it now, but I can't seem to get the ear of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, the one country, though, might be a bit tricky. Because if you're an automobile a maker and you need the platinum or palladium or rhodium, you know, there's only two countries in Africa that produce that. You know, if you are an EV maker and you need the feedstock, whether it's manganese or nickel or cobalt, lithium, you know, that would be a different country. So if the government came to me, I would pick probably two or three different countries based on what the 20, 30, 50 year goal is for, for North America. And but it is part- fixable. It is fixable. Um, I'm not sure they want to hear how to fix it, um, but it is absolutely fixable. This is a tough one, Russell. Which critical mineral would you put as the number one priority? Well, you know, if you want to be green, uh, you need to have uh, uranium, but you can't build a nuclear power plant without cobalt. So, you know, it depends what your priorities are. If your priorities are uh, to have massive housing um, and you need to have 30-story skyscrapers, you know, your critical mineral would be niobium or vanadium, right? So it all depends on on what the goal of the country and the government is. Um, you know, fossil fuels is going to be around for longer than I think people expect. So uh, it might not be lithium, particularly with sodium ion batteries now coming to the forefront. Um, you know, it, it, it's I think that's a how long is a piece of string type of answer, unfortunately, because each country, each country, each government has different goals and different requirements and different needs. So we want to avoid war. Although if we go to war, that's going to change the critical critical prioritization as well. Jack, let's say we're prioritizing green or EVs. Which critical minerals in Africa and which country in Africa would you be prioritizing? Uh, the Congo or, or intensity or because they have lithium. Uh, a lot of lithium, but Congo may have, it's probably got the world's largest uh, reserve of of untapped lithium. So that would be my favorite place. No, what I'm saying, and then the Congo has cobalt, the Congo has copper. Uh, That part, and I believe uh, it was our source of uranium in in the great dust-up of WW2. So uh, they've got everything they need for us but they're beginning to think that maybe it should be for them. Uh, uh, I just saw the other day that after 10 or 15 years, I can't remember which of the big uh, mining companies it is, has just go, got the go-ahead on the world's largest iron ore deposit in Rio. It's Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto. Okay. okay. And, and I want to emphasize something here, that it's wonderful to talk about critical minerals and all that stuff for cell phones and all the things we can't, in television we can't live without. But in Africa, you're going to need steel to build a civilization. And guess what? 
looks like Guinea might be providing the iron, okay? And there's plenty of coal for coking in Africa. Uh, and so we'll have blast furnaces and, and the coal also, you know, be providing not only coke, but fuel. So I wonder if Africa isn't going to go through an industrialization that very much resembles Europe and America about a hundred years ago. Okay, so they may not be too interested in our problems, except to help them with technology and, and initially with capital. Okay, and if they ever have any surplus, most Americans don't know that Africa has a billion people, so they may not have any surplus in the near future. But if they do, I guess we could buy it at prices at which they determine if we have enough RMB to pay for it. For the sake of this conversation, Mel, I'd like you to give, and I'd like to extend this question to all three of you. I'd like you to provide advice to the U.S. government on how they should conduct themselves in Africa. And can you also make a comment on how the Middle Eastern uh, community should uh invest in Africa at this time, a piece of advice for them. So you're going to give a piece of advice to the Americans about investing in Africa and a piece of advice to the Middle Eastern community as well for investing in Africa. I'm going to start off by surprising the collective universe by not selecting the DRC as a model country for American success for a couple of reasons. You know, the in my personal opinion, <clears throat> the most successful African state is Botswana. And there's a reason for that. Two tribes, one of which is massively dominant numerically over the other. The dominant one chose freely to share the diamond resources with the smaller tribe. And they've been, you know, peacefully going along, taking care of their business. Using that as a launching pad, you know, I think that America should look to Namibia. Great uranium resources in Namibia. Other resources also available there as well. Fewer tribes, beautiful port, so easy logistics, comparatively speaking. Because if you're going to do it, you have to go full bore and you have to bring success because you are being scrutinized and other countries must want what you're offering. So my advice in terms of Washington would be, pick your target carefully, pick it strategically. Energy is the linchpin to the success of economic transformation. It's wonderful to say, let's all build EVs. We all need to be able to charge those EVs somehow whether it's going to be through, you know, a Lend-Lease program or pull in and get a different battery or whether it's going to be a charging station. Irrelevant. It comes down to energy. You can build all the skyscrapers you want. If you can't power them so that people can ride up to their 20th floor condo in an elevator, irrelevant. So I, I do agree. Russell sort of denominated uranium as a key mineral. I'm going to go with uranium, of which Namibia has a lot. The U.S. needs to go in politically, to work with the government of Namibia on a national economic development plan that suits their needs. Provide appropriate capital funding, not USAID development resources. And most importantly, actually have a dialogue with American companies and provide some reassurance to American companies. Yes, go do business over there. We're going to make sure that Exxon provides you bridge funding. Yes, go do business over there. We're going to make sure that you get the necessary import export insurance. And oh, by the way, they're doing business insurance. We'll issue it ourselves if we have to. These are impediments to American businesses that are very rarely talked about. And oh, by the way, Namibia has far fewer human rights problems. We haven't even touched on the potential obstacles posed for Western end users in terms of sourcing out of Africa. Concerns about child labor, concerns about uh, abuse of women, concerns about a variety of things that would mean that we will have difficulty buying the products from Africa. And maybe it's a good example. What would I say to the Middle East? Gosh, it's hard to provide advice 
to a country that is sufficiently wealthy that it's not even concerned about making losses on its investments. But what I would say is humility is important. Africans expect and demand respect in relationships. And historically, that's kind of a problem for the Middle Easterners. Work on that one. Who would like to go next? Russ or Jack? I'll go next. I'll go next. I'll take a hybrid of, of, of Mel and Jack. So if I was the U.S. government um, and I wanted to make a difference, you need two things. You need electricity and you need logistics. And what I would do, everyone's familiar with a nuclear submarine and, uh, and a nuclear aircraft per, uh, carrier. I would take that type of energy unit and put one every thousand kilometers. And so it's easy to build. It's manageable. And what happens is, is you can put it in areas there that uh, you would not normally uh, see electrification. And I would electrify everything first. Um, and that would actually help a lot in terms of communications, telecoms, uh, industry and such. And then I would make sure that the rail and road system, or particularly the rail, and you've seen that with the Boto Corridor and the U.S. government sponsoring that. Um, and it's actually sent its first cup of concentrate down the rail a week ago or so. In terms of a country, uh, I think there's just too many countries to actually pick. What I can say is from the South, you know, you've seen Ford, you've seen Chevy, you've seen Mercedes, you've seen BMW, all high-tech type of automobile manufacturers in South Africa. So you know that the ability and the capabilities are there. And in fact, that's where probably the, the uh, battery manufacturing plants will be located because the OEMs want their EV battery manufacturing plant as close to assembly line as possible. The other part that I would look at is I would look at East Africa, and I think uh, it was touched on a little bit earlier. Again, it's more of a regional, um, and it's closer to Saudi Arabia and such. But there are a lot of those minerals that we've been speaking about now that are located in that Ethiopian, Sudanese, uh, Ugandan area. Um, so that would be, a and there's, and there's 100, 110 million people plus in that region. So you have some consumers there. And you have the ability to, uh, again, if you electrify it properly, you have the ability to put some type of commerce in, you have ports. So uh, for the U.S. government, uh, my advice to them is, is take these small uh, reactors that you use in submarines, put them every thousand kilometers, start electrifying the place, give the people the Wi-Fi, give the people the telecommunications, work on the logistics. For the Middle East, I think they they have a long road to run. They're certainly ahead of the U.S. in terms of investing in Africa, in my mind. Um, but they have a long way to catch up uh, versus the Chinese. And I sit back and I'll watch them, and I won't give them any advice but I'll sit there and watch them and see how that relationship between Middle East and China, India, and the Middle East and the Western you know, Western world develops because it could be complimentary or it could be adversarial. I just don't know yet. Jack? Well, I, I have an idea. Uh, you know, uh, the, the real problem with electrification is wiring the place, the grid. Not not producing the power, getting it to the customers. That that's going to be awful difficult in, in, in a continent without roads and without bridges over you know rivers and things like that. Here's I have a real good idea, and Russell made me think of it. American companies and British companies and European companies are shutting down their internal combustion engine manufacturing lines. Let's move them to Africa. So the uh -huh. Africans can have internal, they can drive their Range Rovers and their Jeeps all over the place. They, they, they've been doing this in movies forever, okay? And they won't need to have a grid, just a gas station. And a gas station could be fed by a truck that's also running on gasoline, doesn't need any wires. So why not let Africa go and develop the way we did? First, let's have internal combustion engines Range Rovers and Jeeps, I'm using them because they don't need roads so much, okay? Uh, gasoline trucks running around uh, to filling stations. And we'll, they'll be able to move around and get things done. How are they going to get to that site for the reactor without a truck, okay, <laughs> without a Jeep? So, I, and, and our American companies, in their wisdom, are shutting down their, their factories. So before they have a second wind, let's have 
let's say the UAE or Saudi, buy those factories and move them and the remaining geriatrics who know how to run them to Africa to train them. I'm very serious. Let's, I'm starting a movement, Africa for internal combustion engines. <laughs> okay? Because that's going to work. You don't need billions. And so billions. is this your advice for the American government? Yes. Buy those plants, move them to Africa, and look like you're trying to help. And what kind of advice would you give to the Middle Easterners uh, who are investing, uh, expanding their investment dollars into Africa at this time and in the critical mineral sector? Develop a gigantic end, use, end user of oil products in Africa. Huge market. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. This Critical Minerals Institute Masterclass on the Middle Eastern uh, investment dollars into the critical mineral sector. If you'd like more information on any of the individuals who participated today, please go to our website. They are all, uh, their links to their LinkedIn accounts are on the site. Thank you.